Down as organized. Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And my name's Greg Knapp. I am in for Greg Columbus. You can find out more about me and get a free gift at GregoryBnapp.com. That's Gregory, B as in boy, K-N-A-P-P.com. I've actually got a new podcast that just launched. You can get it on an Apple Podcasts. Just search my name. It'll pop right up. Give it a listen and subscribe. And I'm joined by Jim Garrity. He is the senior political correspondent of National Review, and his Twitter handle is at Jim Garrity, and this is the Three Martini Lunch. So we'll start with a good martini. Stephanie Grisham is the new White House press secretary. She's there in North Korea. She's trying to get the U.S. press pool through so we can report on what's going on. The North Koreans don't want it. Oh, man, a scrum takes place. Give a listen. U.S. poll. What do you think, Jim? So first of all, for everyone listening to that audio, uh, if you get a chance to go look for the video of this, do so, because it's not as organized as it sounds. Uh, it actually <laughs> sounds even worse than that. It clearly sounds like the North Korean uh, security personnel were not going to allow the U.S. press pool to go through there. Usually you can't have every reporter who's traveling with the president get to be in the room for small rooms when they're doing these one-on-one sorts of things. So you kind of designate two or three people. Usually it's like one cameraman, one print reporter, and sometimes one radio reporter who get to be in the room, collect it, and then all of their video and audio and information goes back to everybody else. That's what makes it a pool. And for some reason, the North Koreans did not want them to go through there. And it's fascinating. Stephanie Grisham is not a terribly big woman trying to hold a, a little aisle opens for these uh, reporters to come through. So it's kind of a surreal, chaotic uh, scene at the uh, DMZ there. But this is getting Stephanie Grisham some, some high praise from the likes of Eric Wemple of the Washington Post and other folks who have not always been big fans of the administration, certainly have very little nice, few nice things to say about Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And look, this is the job of the White House press secretary. This is you know, to ensure on these international trips, you're going to be dealing with hostile states, that don't believe in freedom of the press and who simply aren't used to having reporters having access to these sorts of things. But it is a matter of U.S. policy that when there's a public event with the U.S. president, part of the White House press corps, the pool reporters get to go in there. So good for this, you know, a rare situation in which, you know, this administration and Trump calling him enemy of the people and all that stuff. Look, here she is fighting for access, fighting to make sure that this does get covered. Obviously, considering the, the importance of the visuals of this meeting, I'm sure she and the rest of the administration very much wanted the pictures and coverage of this to get out. But look, she got uh, got bruised apparently from that exchange. And so uh, a little bit of kudos to her and to say, hopefully, uh, just recognize that for all the occasional heated rhetoric that this administration does from time to time, stand up for access to reporters when they need it. And I loved, and I don't know if you could hear it in that clip, what I saw was when she kind of body checked the North Koreans to open this little lane she was going go 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 she was it was like it was a yes. military maneuver moves. right Get yeah, very much it looks like she, you know every white house press secretary usually has some sort of uh exciting opportunities to wait them after they leave government service i think grisha may have some hockey contracts in her future she really <laughs> she really checked that guy into the boards pretty tough so that was pretty good stuff absolutely all right so that was martini number one and jim has a sponsor for us So if you're carrying revolving debt, that means you're not paying off your credit card every month and you could be paying thousands of dollars in interest every year that you don't have to. That's why there's Lending Club. With Lending Club, you can consolidate your debt or pay off your credit cards with one fixed monthly payment. Since 2007, Lending Club has helped millions of people regain control of their finances with affordable fixed rate personal loans. No trips to a bank, no high interest credit cards. Just go to LendingClub.com, tell them about yourself, and how much you want to borrow, you pick the terms that are right for you, and if you're approved, your loan will be automatically deposited into your bank account in as little as a few days. Lending Club is the number one peer-to-peer lending platform with more than $35 billion in loans issued. So go to lendingclub.com forward slash martini, that's M-A-R-T-I-N-I. I really do hope you know how to spell martini by this point. Check your rate in minutes and borrow up to $40,000. Once again, that's lendingclub.com forward slash martini. All loans are made by WebBank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. There you go. So you might need a martini before you call them, but hopefully (laughs) afterwards you won't. That's how that works. All right. So martini number two, we got a bad one here. We saw this was coming. Iran announced it. 
they are now saying, yep, we told you 10 days ago we were going to do this, and we are now surpassing the limits for enriched uranium that was in the Iran uranium deal. So is this something really unexpected? No. But who's going to stop them from just continuing to increase this, Jim? What happens next? Yeah. This is, as you said, this is a one we kind of had was coming down the pike, was very likely. Look, uh, I've, you know, been a longstanding critic of the Iran deal. Uh, it did not include enough verification tools, enough verification processes, explicitly said that there would be no international inspections of Iranian military sites. Now, here's the thing. If you want to develop a nuclear weapon in secret, and the rules say we're not allowed to look in this area, that's exactly where you're going to put all of your secret nuclear weapons development. Mm -hmm. uh, but once the U.S. said, you know, the Trump administration came in, announced they were withdrawing from the Iran deal, there was a possibility that they were going to go down this path and the Iranian regime was going to say, oh, okay, all right, fine. If you guys are backing out, we're going to back out. We're going to do whatever we want. And now they've done this. And what's very clear is, look, we're trying to get as many sanctions on this regime as possible. You put as much pressure on Tehran, you get them back to the negotiating table, and then maybe you can negotiate a deal that actually has a robust inspection regime instead of one that says, okay, we're going to take your word that you're not developing a nuclear weapon and we promise to not look over there. And oh, by the way, Iran has had plenty of secret nuclear facilities they've been building over the various years. Now, you can tell the Iranians are very much using the carrot and the stick. They're saying that this move is reversible. But if Europe doesn't take necessary action to uphold the other side of the deal, we will continue to reduce our commitment to the agreement. This is from the Islamic Republic News Agency. So basically, at the time, we're trying to get more European countries to put more sanctions on Iran. Iran is basically saying, hey, you put more sanctions on us. We're going to you know, enrich more uranium again. If Iran is so quick to go to this tool, I think it indicates just how determined they are to have these stockpiles of uranium that can be used in nuclear weapons. So their goal is to have a nuclear weapon and then use it as leverage over the rest of the region. It's going to be a very tough choice for Europe, but my, you know, my fear is that they will knuckle under, not embrace greater sanctions and try to give more trade deals to help Iran's economy so the pressure on the regime is uh, uh, lessened. Wait a second. The Europeans caving in? No. Yeah. yeah. What are the odds of that? <laughs> no, Jim, I think you nailed it when you're saying they were always doing this. That was the problem. One of the main problems with the deal, there was no way to make sure they weren't doing this. They've always cheated on these deals. It's just like with North Korea. We tried deals with North Korea. We'll give you oil. We'll give you food. We'll help this. We'll help that. And they were always cheating on the deal from day one. So Democrats now are saying, well, this only happened because Trump pulled out of the deal. Where was the evidence they weren't doing this before we pulled out of the deal? And where's the evidence they won't continue to do it no matter what Europe does? Because they saw what happened with North Korea. You get the bomb, you get you get negotiating power, and you get leverage. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it comes down to who is... Nobody wants a war. Nobody wants a conflict, although some might argue we are in a you know low level or secret war on the level of uh, sabotage and other things that are happening in the region, the shooting down of the U.S. surveillance drone, things like that. Mm -hmm. Basically, this comes down to who wants it more. And in the case of the Europeans, their top priority is avoiding conflict. Well, when that is your top priority, you will all find yourself making concessions over and over again because you're more frightened of them than they are of you. Exactly. Um, Bad, bad negotiating on the part of the Europeans, I suspect, but seems to be very deep in their mindset these days. All right. So let's move on to the crazy martini. We got one left. And this started in, I guess, really the public's view of this, Jim, with the debate last Thursday night when Kamala Harris and Joe Biden got into that famous little back and forth on the idea of busing to desegregate schools. Now, it had been percolating for a few weeks before when Joe Biden was talking about some of the segregationists that he worked with on the Democratic side, and it got everybody talking. But then after that, now we've got Elizabeth Warren talking about busing, and, and Bernie Sanders are talking about whether we should bus or not. We're talking about now, now busing. What's going on, Jim? Uh, yesterday, Kamala Harris was asked, she was at a, a pride parade in San Francisco, and she was asked, what is your position on busing, and what do you think the federal government role should be? She said, I support busing. Listen, the schools of America are as segregated, if not more segregated today than I was in elementary school. I very much would dispute that. But let's go. Me too. We need to put every effort, including busing, into play to desegregate the schools. And why is desegregation important? Well, but she goes a bit about that. That's one small piece of the very big piece. And some of the questioner then asks, what is the role of the federal government? Uh, she says the federal government has historically has a role to play in ensuring equality in America. She basically is indicating she supports the federal government forcing busing 
of school children in order to ensure sufficient integration and ensure sufficient diversity in schools. Now, this is all taking place with a remarkable oblivious as to why busing was very unpopular back in the 1970s. You could say, oh, this was a matter of a reflection of the racist attitudes at the time. But in fact, support, support for busing was fairly low amongst African Americans. Uh, I believe one poll by Gallup way back then had support down around 5%. This is not obviously a topic people haven't been discussing for a long time, but back in the 90s, there was a poll that put it all the way up to about 10 or 11% support of it. The vast majority of people did not like the idea of their kids being shipped halfway across town or all the way across town to a completely different school to hit some sort of artificial threshold of what kind of level of diversity there should be in that school. Now, I think you know most people would say, you know, as strong supporters of school choice, if you want to send your kid to the, the, the school across the other side of town, that's great. You should have that choice. You should have that option. But the idea of the government telling you you have to, and of course, putting kids into different uh, neighborhoods they're not familiar with, and, and all that, that, you know, that, that, that parents don't like that. Communities don't like that. You know, the most fascinating person to say that, to, to raise some objections to this, is that notorious arch right wing figure, <clears throat> Bernie Sanders, mm-hmm. uh, who said that uh, busing is certainly an option that is necessary in certain cases, but is not optimal. Does anybody think it's a good idea to put a kid on a bus, travel an hour to another school, to another neighborhood that he doesn't know? That's not the optimal. What is the optimal is to have great community schools which are integrated. That's what I think most people want to see. That's what I want to see. And and Jim, Uh, that's the tough thing, isn't it? Because I I was defending Joe Biden on the idea that not everybody who was against busing in the 60s was a racist. And just as you pointed out, most people don't want their kid to be bused an hour. And then you've got the people that are like, I worked all my life to move to a neighborhood that had a good school. That's why I bought this house so my kids could go to the good school. And now you're going to ship my kid an hour away to a school that's not doing well? How is that fair? And that doesn't matter whether you're white, black, purple, or polka dot. That's how most people felt about that. But the other side is, well, then how do you desegregate? We're talking about the 60s. Um, and and it, that's why it was such a, a very difficult thing. And then, of course, there were racists who just didn't want black mm-hmm. kids in the white schools. So so this question is still out there of, OK, how do you how do you try to make it so that everybody has equal opportunity? And I think you nailed it with the vouchers where you let people choose instead of forcing. Yeah, it's going to be really fat. My hope is that in the next they don't have another debate for another month, but my hope is that they actually ask about this. I think it'd be a very interesting show of hands, as they say. Clearly, you had a comment from Harris, a comment from Elizabeth Warren that indicated, although she was kind of vague about it. Sanders is indicating that he doesn't think it's necessarily a good idea, or he calls it not optimal. You know, should there be institute? Should they bring back busing? Should students be shipped to different schools in order to end what turns into de facto segregation, even if there is no legal segregation going on under the law? And my suspicion is, is that now at least at least a good chunk of the Democrats running for president would support that. It has never been popular. Maybe another interesting case where their primary base is pulling them in a direction that will probably cost them a great deal in the general election. We'll have to wait and see. But that's what I said made it qualify as our crazy martini of the day. You're absolutely right, Jim. When they're talking about you know free health care for illegal immigrants, um, getting rid of all private health insurance, rebusing for so-called segregated schools, they're going about as far left as we've ever seen in Democrat primary debate. So we'll see what the American people think. Oh, oh, Jim, I was going to throw this at you. So as they're talking about how this is so horrible that supposedly we're resegregating K through 12, we've got colleges where they're voluntarily segregating, saying we need a dorm for people of color. We need a student union just for people of color. So they're choosing to segregate when they're in college Yet we're being told we've got a bus to desegregate K through 12. It's yeah. getting really crazy. This is the sort of issue where if, uh, you know, if, if the Democratic nominee does support this position, it's very easy to picture Trump just devouring the opponent on this issue. Because even if they'd said, like, you could even make an argument to say, well, if a community believes that busing kids across school is needed to generate better you know, education outcomes for everybody, if down the road some other town decides to do that, I, I you know I believe in local control, and it'd be all right. If you guys really think this is what's best for your community, you guys go ahead and do it. But that's not what the Democrats are talking about. Mm. You know, Harris is quite explicit. This needs to be you know come down from on high on stone tablets from Washington D.C. And uh, I think that would really drive even people who might like the idea in theory would probably have serious problems with the Department of Education kind of forcing this upon school districts. Yeah, especially once it becomes your kid who's bust an hour away. That's when it starts to hit home, right? All right. Well, Jim, we appreciate it. That's all three of the martinis today. Jim Garrity, he is the senior political correspondent 
of National Review. And you can follow him on Twitter at Jim Garrity. And my name is Greg Knapp, gregorybnapp.com. Check out my new podcast. It's called Find Your Purpose, Live Your Passion. Give it a listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We'll see you again for the three martini lunch.